another coup d'etat in Africa, and this time it's in Guinea as the military arrests President Kande and dissolves the government. Plus, the federal government of Nigeria warns political and religious leaders not to set the nation in place with incendiary rhetoric. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anako. In 2021 alone, there have been three major coups in Africa. The Malian coup d'etat on the 24th of May 2021, the Chad coup d'etat, which resulted in the death of long-serving leader Idris Deby, and most recently, in Guinea, special forces have seized power in a coup, arrested the president, and promised to change the political makeup of the country. Well, joining us to discuss this is peace and conflict expert West Africa Nkasi Wodu and political analyst and researcher Kambale Musavuli. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm going to start with you, Kambale, because I saw your, your post on social media and you had quite a lot to say. Um, I mean, I know I've spoken to you about other issues um, in the DRC, but this time, uh, Guinea. And there's so many question marks on, you know, this coup d'etat. But look, I hear that it has sparked a lot of fear in the hearts of the ordinary civilians, uh, you know, in the country. But then we also saw a lot of people celebrating in the streets. But let's start by looking at, you know, the reasons why the army have taken over. They're talking about high-handedness. They're talking about corruption issues and, you know, personal, uh, personalization of institutions in the state. Um, so let's look at the government of Conde uh, since he came into power in 2010. I mean, the claims uh, provided by the coup plotters are valid claims from the people. It's not, they're not the first one to say that. The people of Guinea uh, have been... Uh, challenging the change in the constitution of the country. I mean, just uh, last year, there was an election there where the president of uh, Guinea changed the terms to be three terms there. People were in the streets. Uh, the election was more with irregularities. People denounced it. So they're just expressing the aspirations of the people. The challenge is uh, the method they use uh, to take control of the country. We've seen this before. I mean, when you look at Zimbabwe, uh, people were jubilating. Uh, the, the position of Mugabe. Uh, today, we see that uh, the current rule of the country is not the aspirations of the people. So any revolutionary process that does not come from the people itself, uh, we know through our own experience, uh, our human history, that it will not result to fundamental change. But I can understand why the Guinean people, um, a section of them, a large section of the Guinean people, are uh, celebrating uh, the coup uh, because the expression is more, they are happy uh, there is change in the leadership of the country and they want a leadership that represents them. Interesting. So um, let's take a look at, you know, um, Conde's leadership, you know, style, which is something that you've pointed to. Um, he spent decades in opposition to the previous leaders and he's, you know, been in opposition to um, previous regimes. He seemed to be someone who really wanted to lead the country. And finally, he was given an opportunity to do so. But then here we are. It took a coup d'etat to get him out of office. And obviously, you're saying and re-echoing what the people are saying, he did not live up to expectations. So I ask you, because I'm, coming, I'm going somewhere with my question, why do we have African leaders who keep pushing to want to lead the country, who wax very lyrical when it comes to um, the right things to say, but when it comes to um, actualizing those promises, we see a total different thing? The institutions are personalized. Uh, we don't have strong institutions uh, and practice of uh, d democratic rule uh, that is not personalized. That's one of the challenges in some of the countries, uh, particularly in Guinea. Uh, it was really up to uh, Conde to change that met methodology of always looking at uh, this uh, providential leader who will fix everything. If the institutions were strong, the judiciary, uh, the executive, and other institutions, we wouldn't be where we are now. Um, 
but then it's up to the African people to change it, right? Uh, we, we have the same issues in DRC. Uh, we just had a presidential election in DRC. There was more irregularities, and the opposition leader has taken control of the country. And we're seeing that now, where he's changing the uh, justices, right? That's only a reflection that there is not a strong civil society. There is not a strong left movement in the country. And because of that vacuum of a strong organization, the only organizing force is the military. And the military is filling up the vacuum, and it's an instrument of violence. So we know that uh, they are not going to resolve the fundamental aspirations uh, of the people. But I think, uh, in my view, I think those are superficial uh, discussions. I, I think that we have to look at Guinea in the context of the region, its strategic position, its mineral wealth. What does this coup mean? Uh, for the region, for the people. Uh, just if you look at the statement that came out of the meeting today, uh, the former ministers and the coup plotters at the meeting today, and they came out with about seven points of things that's going to move forward. Uh, one thing that, that took uh, my attention is, uh, I think it's point five or six, where uh, they said that there will not be a curfew on mining operations in the country. Right. So there are all these changes, but somehow for money, People can still mine, so that, that begs to uh, but, that brings the but, question. But, 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 why? If, but if you put a sh but if you shut down mining activities, because I, I see that um, uh, you know ore is a big you know um, mineral resource in Guinea, and 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 you can't really just shut it down because that seems to be an income earner. So if you shut it down, then it means that you're obviously declaring a state of emergency on the economy of the country. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is 24 hours after the coup. Let's think about it. The borders are shut down. Everything is one of the major decisions. Twenty-four hours out after the coup is around mining operations. We're not thinking about uh, the well-being of the people. People went out in the streets. You know how many people have died. What is the situation in the country? One of the major decisions, right after the coup, is to make sure that the uh, mining operations are not affected. That tells me that they are also listening to outside interest, not just the interest of the. Uh, people there. But beyond that, too, I think we can even speak about those who did the coup. It's a particular special force within the military, not under the jurisdiction of the Minister of Defense, uh, trained uh, by the French, and particularly Africa, U.S. Africa. They've been trained uh, in Burkina Faso extensively. Some of them have actually come to the War College in the United States for training. So this is a unit that does not, in my view, have allegiance to the Guinean people. So, I mean, the, the so dust we So, are you supposing that the U.S. Human. government and the French authorities have a hand in this coup? And what would be their benefits? I'm going to go to um, Kasi in a bit, but I want you to, because you seem to have this theory, uh, you know, that they, there might be the hand of Issa in this particular matter. So, explain to me why you think the U.S. and maybe the French forces are involved. I don't think that Guinean soldiers or Guinean militaries are training French and American soldiers, right? So that's something for us to be clear. Whenever I'm speaking about the military training of the soldiers, the, the Americans and the French el allow these military forces to have military training where they are involved in coups. We've seen that in Mali. we see that in Chad. Uh, when we look at the, the region, why is, I believe, that Guinea is important? Uh, there, there is presence of China. Uh, what will be the interest of the United States in Guinea? Uh, China has a $20 million deal uh, for infrastructure and mineral exploration. Uh, there are other uh, deals also happening around iron ore. Uh, they have the largest iron ore in the world. And I'm sure some have followed the case of the diamond, the Benis diamond, the Israeli businessman, caught with corruptions. There are many interests, um, particularly mining interests, that is at stake in Guinea. And that is also tied to Chinese operation. If the United States and France is involved, it will be clearly to counter China in the region. And that's how I would like uh, to frame at least my analysis that to understand it's not just a local issue, a regional, it does have international ties. And Cassie, looking at democracies across the African continent and, um, you know, a bit to stabilize it side by side with these coup cool attempts, mostly um, as a result of bad leadership, will it be? What will be the future of, you know, um, the constitutional governments in West Africa and the African continent at large if we continuously see these calculated coup attempts? And to borrow from what, um, you know, Kambale is saying, that 
you know, we cannot just jettison the fact that there is something, you know, in Guinea that the rest of the world might be eyeing. Um, so, it does pose a very dangerous trend, really. Um, it, it is something to be worrying about. Um, in, in the past four years, we've had a um, specific number of coups. We've had coups in Zimbabwe, we've had coups in Mali, in Chad, in Sudan, um, and now in Guinea. Um, so, this really, really is troubling. Um, but it does tell a, a particular story, and it, as worrying as the trend is, it tells a particular story. One, um, it really points to the fact that um, one of the one of the issues around um, that aid coup um, intervention, uh, military intervention in African countries. Um, I mean, we see that talking about corruption, we see poor leadership, um, we see um, the fact that these particular leaders that were victims of, of coups um, were, were not leading the countries well. I mean, they were actually bad leaders. Um, so that is one of the troubling things. Secondly, as Kambali has stated, is the point that there is an issue of institutions. Um, we have a lot of institutions in, in Africa that are really failing. Um, we, have, we have a tendency to really um, and, and make the, the actual leader the institution rather than um, build institutions ourselves. And so when we get to that point, we see where there is really no institution to hold the particular leader in check. I mean, you, you ask the question um, about the fact why um, African leaders would, would, um, would time to become leaders, and then they would go in and then they wouldn't do the work. And, uh, and, and it's really about institutions. And when we talk about institutions, we're talking about um, the, the things like the police, we talk about the various arms of government, like the judiciary, like the legislator. I mean, these are particular institutions that should hold or keep in check um, the particular leaders. And we have a situation where um, one of the major casualties of um, African leadership, I mean, dictatorial leadership in Africa, at this institution, because when you become a strong man, you become an all in all. But then ultimately, that leads to an issue. It leads to an issue where, like, you have the military well trained and strong, and they are feeling to become the only institution that, though untainted, um, untainted in fact, that untouched by the leaders, that are able to intervene. But that's a problem, because we cannot, uh, if we are going to build democratic institutions, and stable government in Africa. We cannot depend on the military consistently because it puts us in a situation where, one, people see that the power does not reside in the people anymore, right? So if the people cannot decide leaders for themselves or, in a sense, decide the change of leadership by themselves and they will depend on military intervention, that puts a really serious situation because it could for instance, lead to a point where um, African leaders begin to depend on the military. They, they see the military as the people that they should be rather than the people. Um, but one of the major points to note here is that there is often a correlation between unstable democracy, unstable leadership, and incessant coup d'etat in Africa. I mean, for example, in the past 40, in the past four decades, We've had about a hundred coup d'etat um, and two hundred successful, uh, two, uh, hundred successful coup d'etat and two hundred attempted coups in, in Africa. That's really, really troubling for a particular nation where um, its earliest um, independence was in the 1950s. So it is very, very troubling. Um, it, it creates an avenue of instability. It creates an avenue where people do not see, um, where people do not have hope in democratic institutions where elections and political participation do not yield the desired result. And that's really, really troubling for the African continent. It's really, really troubling for the African Union and, so, and for some of the other regional bodies like the ECOWAS um, and SADC as well. I just want to push you a little bit more on the issue of strong institutions because we, that's, that's something we play around with in Nigeria. We say, oh, we don't need strong men. We need strong institutions. We just throw it around there, but we never realistically um, do anything about it or you know, push for it. Um, and so from what you and Kambale have said, yes, it's the obvious that you're stating, but if I have pushed, for example, our president, Bahari, has been trying to run for this office four times, finally his president. And I know that you're not in Nigeria, but you understand what the, the Nigerian system is facing right now. I mean, the Naira is taking a deep dive. Um, the economy is in its worst state. Insecurity is <laughs> rife. 
The list is endless. Um, but when we say we want to change something, this change obviously is supposed to begin with that leader. And that should, shouldn't that be handsing off the legislature, handsing off the judiciary, allowing these systems to thrive and, and be independent somewhat, especially in Nigeria. We have the Independent National Electoral Commission. We have the ICPC. We have the EFCC. How independent are they? And if a leader is not able to project that change, how are we supposedly to get these strong institutions? Are they supposed to fall from the sky? So um, thank you very much, Mary, and that's a very good question. Um, but the activity is involved here. Um, in Africa and in Nigeria, and just like in many other African countries, we are paying the price of not investing in strengthening institutions over the time. Right? Institutions are not built in a day or, or built in the, within the tenure of the particular or, of, of the particular yeah. president. It's something that needs to be done consistently over time. So whatever we say in Nigeria or in some other African country, like we say in Guinea and Mali right now, is years and decades of neglect of those institutions. Right? So that's one. And so we come to the point where um, there is a particular leader that sort of pulls the thread and the whole edifice comes calling down. Because none of these things or none of these institutions have been built on a solid foundation. That's one. Secondly, it's also important for us to understand that um, how do we build the institution? Yes, institutions are manned by people, but institutions are also um, as a result of laws, as a result of principles, as a result of, um, demo of, of, of um, documentation that are put in place where everybody decides to abide by this particular set of rules. And when we do not focus on building those institutions, we come to a situation where the leaders now become the strong man. We become to a situation where um, citizens in Africa focus exclusively on the strong man or the strength of a particular leader. I mean, we, we saw that in, in 2015 elections where a, a, a former president was led, led um, lost elections because people felt he wasn't strong enough. Um, by investing in institutions, by patiently building on the judiciary, investing not just resources, investing um, and time and skill on, on in the judiciary, in the police, um, in, in other several institutions like the legislature, we're essentially trying to create a system that is apart from that leader. I mean, take for instance, in, in the general um, insurrection, I mean, I, I like to call it insurrection in the US, um, where people, actually wanted to prevent the complete handover of or the, the, the validation or certification of results in the US. Um, it was people. I mean, and even though there was a particular situation where um, the president of the country was actually in support of the non-certification process, um, the institution held. And that is an example of how you institutions that you, you spend decades building. Um, um, it, it comes from different systems of government, different um, uh, successive government coming, playing their own role, playing their own role. But it's also about bravery of the particular people that have been led to man this institution. And, and, and we've seen um, examples of brave um, judging um, in dictatorial um, and settings, not just in, in Africa. I mean, in Nigeria, we've seen that in Nigeria. We've seen that in so many other countries as well. We've seen institutions, we've seen situations where um, particular strong persons that have actually put their foot down and said, no, this is not how it should be done. But the problem is that if we do not create an incentive where the people that man particular institutions um, are incentivized, are promoted to actually um, ensure that those institutions do the things that they are meant to do. In fact, a situation that we currently face right now, where um, essentially institutions are poor, institutions are crumbling, and um, the strong man um, policy is what, is what takes place. And we see um, a particular um, president or, or a political leader that has they overstay their welcome. They, they do not have problems in um, essentially um, destroying the, the ground norm, that the constitution that holds the, the, the fabric of society together. And so that's the kind of problem that we're going to be meeting. Well, I, my next question was for Kambali, but I think we lost a connection with him. Hopefully we can get him back. But I'm, this next question, I'm going to put it to you. Democracy is great and all. We're all thriving and striving to, you know, get to the point where America has gotten to. And even America, after 200 years, still has, you know, teething problems with, you know, their democratic system. Um, 
we know it also puts the people's interest above uh, every other thing. But how practicable is democracy uh, in Africa today, knowing where we're coming from and where we are right now, because it's still taking a long time for us to integrate, you know, the democratic system. We still have that um, autocratic and, you know, dictatorial spirit, you know, in the guise of a democracy. So, and must we be democratic to have good leadership? Can we not have good leadership without it being democratic. And I'm not saying that we should jettison democracy in, in its entirety, but I'm asking, if it isn't really practicable across the continent, should we be looking at other forms of government as it may work within those different domains? Yeah, um, so I've heard this argument before. I mean, a lot of times, really, particularly from Africa. Uh, the reason democracy fails in Africa is not because of democracy. It's not the fault of democracy. It is the fault of people that have essentially refused to build. The democracy is not a magic wand or um, a, 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 a silver bullet that makes all the problems go away. That's not what happens. Um, it, it, is, it involves work. It involves um, rolling up the fees and doing the actual work that you require to do. Um, what we have is, is a situation where we have particular governments in Africa um, take little bits and pieces of what is supposed to be called democracy and then wave it and say, oh, we run an authentic, a democratic system of government. Democratic principles are founded on, on, on the pillars and the foundations of fairness, of, 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 of guaranteeing of human rights, right? Um, the, the fact that um, everybody has a say in how the government works, in political participation, in, in um, elections being held frequently, um, in, in, in the principles of fairness and justice and equity. I mean, these are particular strong foundations and pillars of, of, of democracy. And um, if you can find any other system of government that guarantees this, sign me up. But up until now, democracy is the best form of that. I mean, even in situations where there are particular um, countries in Europe that operate a monarchical system of government, they have to found a way to incorporate democratic tenets. Because you cannot depend on the will or the benevolence of one person to guarantee all this right. Human okay. nature has shown that that is never possible. Right? So we need to have a system where everybody understands the standing and everybody knows that if there's a problem, they know where to seek redress. Power cannot be concentrated in any one man or in any one institution. That is okay. the recipe for disaster. All right, I think we have Kambale back. And this question, uh, I reserved it for you. But Kambale, if you can hear me, let me just go with this question. Now, the United Nations has condemned the coup attempt, uh, the coup plot, rather, uh, in Guinea. The government of Nigeria has done the same, um, and several other people have talked about it. But let's talk about France. Let's talk about the Francophone countries and what's you know been happening. Uh, you're from DRC, and lately we've seen Francophone countries experiencing different kinds of problems, whether it be a coup, whether it be conflicts, whether it be gun running, all sorts of things are happening. And I'm saying most, if not 80%, of Francophone countries. What is France doing um, as a partner to these Francophone countries to douse tension? I, apart from boots on the ground, um, what is France doing to douse the tension in its former French colonies? Because we seem to see a, a trend of sorts in all the Francophone countries on the African continent. Beyond even the Francophone country and the earlier comment you made around the statements, you know, the, let's not forget that the DRC, uh, the president of the DRC is the chairman of the African Union this year. Uh, he has also put out a statement condemning uh, the, the coup. Are you still there, Kambale? Oh, I think that we have network connection issues there. So I'm, I'm just going to leave that question for Kambale to come back to. Uh, but let me go to you, Nkasi. If people seem to be losing, um, you know, hope in the ballots, they're losing faith in the systems of governments, in the judiciary, um, do we see more of these coup attempts happening across the continent? Because... Yes, we see the people on the streets of Guinea rejoicing. It seems like, oh, the army has done them a favor of sorts. But then who holds the army accountable at the end of the day? That's one side of the question. The other side is, 
might we see most, most many more African countries that seem to be oppressed um, having these same kinds of cool plot attempts? I mean, so maybe I, I, I said earlier that this is a dangerous trade. Um, one, because um, if, if people, if, if we are consistently hoping on, milit on the military to intervene in democratic processes, um, that, that, that's trouble. One, because the military is, has never been known for its democratic tenets or democratic principles, or it, it has parents to the respect for human rights and all of that. It has never been known for that. So we have a situation where we're constantly exchanging one evil for the other. That's essentially what is going to happen. Um, but also, the other worrying part is that if we have a situation, I mean, because African, African leaders, the things about African leaders is that they are highly adaptive. That means they can adapt to any changing situation. If we have a situation where the military becomes sort of that last bastion for, for, for the common man, and I refuse to accept that with any change in me, and we, have, we, we, we will get to the point where leaders become accountable to the military and to military leaders rather than the people. So you have this pseudo democracy where um, there is a democratic government, um, but they are constantly controlled by military backers. Um, that, for the point of, um, for, for the sake of diplomacy, um, would not want to put themselves out there as leaders. So that, those are worrying trends. And I feel with the other question, which I mean, this is um, four years down. We've seen this happen in Zimbabwe. We've seen it happen in Somalia, in Sudan, rather. We've seen it happen in Mali. We've seen it happen in Chad and in Guinea. I mean, and I think that it's going to keep happening, particularly in some of these um, 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 countries. The problem is that we need to do much more than condemn this kind of act. Um, countries, um, and, and one of the ways that we can do that is actually ensure that the condemnation comes even before the military intervention takes place. A, the AU and the other regional governments should not turn a blind eye to okay. particular situations where um, government say where elections are big that people and the leaders perpetuate themselves in office. We okay. need to begin to call out some of these issues and provide strong consequences for action and for particular um, leaders that will have their welcome. Okay. Well, Nkasi Wodu is... Um a peace and conflict expert in West Africa. And of course, uh, we lost Kambale Musavali, but he is a political analyst and a researcher. Thank you very much for being part of the conversation. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break. And when we return, the federal government of Nigeria blows hot and they are not just blowing hot and cold on political and religious critics. They're saying that they need to put an end to the kind of rhetoric that they're putting out. So we'll get to find out more after this break. <laughs>